One of the central ideas that came out of our look at life history evolution was the idea of a trade-off. And we saw that trade-offs could also be conceived of as genetic correlations. Well, this idea turns out to be one of the most important insights in evolutionary medicine. A patient is a bundle of trade-offs. So let's take a look in some detail at what trade-offs are. They originate evolutionarily in a process of tinkering that just works with whatever variation happens to be available at the moment. That essentially means this, the traits that are connected in trade-offs are to a certain degree arbitrary. Machines not designed by engineers. So it is not as though every single aspect of an organism has been perfected. That's not the case at all. Evolution simply has been working with the available variation and the result is often compromised. Not all of the parts of a patient can be plugged in and, uh, and switched out without consequence. This is not replacement part manufacturing. This is organic growth and it's importantly different. Trade-offs require two connections. The first is that there be a connection between two or more traits. It could be genetic, it could be developmental, it could be physiological. It could have roots deep in time. It could be phylogenetically constrained. The connections between those traits uh, must also exist with respect to fitness. If the traits are neutral, we can't really discuss a trade-off because trade-off is expressing a cost-benefit relationship where the currency is fitness. Each of these connections could be either positive or negative. The fact that two traits are connected is not sufficient to say that they are involved in the trade-off. A trade-off is only there when a change in one trait that increases fitness is associated with a change in the other trait that decreases fitness. That's the definition of a trade-off. They have been conceived of a number of different ways. If we think of them as physiological allocations, so you can either take food energy and you can put it into one trait or you can put it into another trait, we get into what is called the Y allocation model. So you can think of a pipe with a diameter, which is the total amount of resource coming in, and a certain amount C of it is given to fecundity, and the remainder, one minus C, is given to maintenance, leading to survival, and that is a characteristic of a locus C. So C is controlling the allocation of this amount of energy coming in into two functions. And we can think of another locus as being uh, involved in efficiency at acquiring. That could be foraging efficiency or feeding efficiency or something like that, and that would determine the diameter of that pipe. This is an idea that Herdine de Jong and Ari von Nordweig came up with. Now, it has a, survive, a surprising outcome. Let's suppose that we have reproduction on the x-axis and survival on the y-axis, and we have three different levels of acquisition, one, two, and three. That would mean that this would be the upper limit on the amount of energy at low acquisition, and this would be the upper limit on the amount of energy at high acquisition. And let's suppose that we have variation as well in how that energy is allocated. If the variation is mostly in acquisition and not very much in allocation, then we have a positive relationship between survival and reproduction. If the variation is mostly in allocation here and not very much in acquisition, then we have a negative relationship. And that might look a little puzzling, but think about it this way. If the variation is mostly in acquisition and the correlation is positive, then we have the situation where rich people have both big houses and nice cars. Okay, so these are the poor people, these are the rich people, and the rich people have both nice houses and nice cars. However, if variation is mostly in allocation, then there's a negative relationship. You can either have a nice house or you can have a nice car, but you can't have both. 
Trade-offs are conceived physiologically are usually thought of as occurring within a single individual. However, they also can occur among the members of a group or the members of a family. There are lots of cases of this. For example, in kestrels, clutch size trades off with age of maturity and with the clutch size of the offspring. So offspring that are coming out of large clutches are not only maturing later, they're having fewer babies than offspring that are coming out of small clutches. In fruit flies, Drosophila, old females lay eggs that have higher juvenile mortality than eggs laid by young females. So the aging of the parent is actually reflected in the quality of the offspring. In red deer, a mother who gives birth to a daughter has a greater risk of mortality than if she gives birth to a son because her son moves away earlier and her daughter stays close to her to feed so they compete for food. And in general, a trade-off can occur within any set of interacting individuals if those interactions are affecting fitness. Now, what about the issue of phenotypic correlations and genetic correlations? We might see that uh, tall, fat people have more babies and short, thin people have fewer babies. That would be a phenotypic correlation. But does it have a genetic basis and would it be a factor in evolution? Well, the phenotypic correlations can exist for a lot of reasons, and many of them are not genetic. And particularly in humans, culture and diet play a big role. Only the connections among traits that have a genetic basis are going to produce trade-offs that have evolutionary consequences. Now, the most convincing way, therefore, to measure a genetic trade-off, and it can't be done in humans, is a correlated response to artificial selection. So you select one trait, and then you see how the other traits respond. This is done over 10 or 15 or 100 generations, and it integrates all of the steps in the life cycle. So it integrates genetic response with development, with plasticity, with ecological interactions, with reproduction. Here is an example of what an organism looks like that's been dissected this way. So these are experiments on fruit flies, and they express correlated responses. So it's a summary of 14 studies done in five labs, probably more than 100 man years of work. And every time you see an arrow in this diagram, it's connecting two traits, say body size and early fecundity. And the arrow is starting at the trait that was selected and it's ending at the trait whose correlated response was measured. And this arrow has a plus next to it. That means that flies were selected to be larger and their correlated response was greater early fecundity. Flies selected to have longer development had greater early fecundity. Importantly, flies selected to have higher early fecundity, notice the negative sign, had shorter lifetimes. Flies selected to live longer had lower early fecundity, and so forth. Now, these are the life history traits. Over here are the underlying physiological traits, starvation resistance, ethanol resistance, flight duration, glycogen content, yolk protein, mRNA, mating speed, when young, when old, and so forth. These depend on nutritional conditions, but they are pretty much what you would expect as correlated responses underlying the changes in these traits. By the way, these are all here, almost all, correlated with late fecundity. So step back for a moment and just look at that picture. Here's an organism. It has up here, uh, somewhere on the order of 12 or 15 traits. There are genetic connections between all of those traits. You can't change one of these things without causing a cascade of changes in many others. What about humans? The central trade-off in life history evolution is between reproduction and mortality, and it's also the trade-off that really governs the evolution of aging, that determines why we grow old and die. Does it actually exist in humans? It's been difficult to measure, and different studies give different results. Here is one result from a study that I was involved in. 
So what we see in the upper panel here is a phenotypic correlation. It's the relative mortality risk is a function of how many offspring a woman has. So zero means she didn't have any, and five meant, means that she had five babies. And what you can see is that her risk of mortality declines for the first and the second child and then rises linearly for the third, fourth, and fifth. This is the number, this, it's a fairly large sample size. So there were about 900 women who had two children and there were about 500 women who had five children in this study. What about the genetic basis of that? That was a phenotypic correlation. Well, we can use the pedigrees of which there are 1,538. So those are all of the family structures, grandparents, parents, offspring, uncles, cousins, things like that. And there are 5,133 5, people in these pedigrees. And we can use the expectation of genetic similarity to see what the genetic contribution might be to these patterns. And the correlation of lifetime reproductive success, that is number of children per lifetime, with age at death was minus 0 0.69. In other words, there was a strong negative genetic correlation. And the correlation of lifetime reproductive success with the age at which the woman be first began to have menses at Menarche was significantly positive. So that would shorten her reproductive interval. In these estimates, the cultural and environmental contributors have been reasonably well controlled. So they've been removed from the data statistically uh, for effects like smoking, education, country of origin, and common environment, living in the same house, that sort of thing. Now, if you ask, using a genome-wide association study, were there particular genes that were responsible for those genetic correlations? Basically, what's going on here, let me just take that off for a second. Basically, we had a relationship between lifespan and number of offspring that was negative. In other words, women who had more offspring had shorter lives. And what we're looking for here is any gene that changes the slope of that relationship significantly. We found several. Uh, this is done with single nucleotide polymorphisms and close to a polymorphism that has this effect there is a gene called EOMIS. It's a master regula regulator gene. It's been implicated in bladder cancer and multiple sclerosis. It's implicated in a lot of things. It doesn't mean it's a cancer gene. It is a gene that does many things. And that's not surprising. It's involved here in a trade-off. However, if we put in things like smoking and total cholesterol and systolic blood pressure to control for their effects, this drops below the level of statistical detection. Okay? So by itself, it seems to have an effect. Apparently, there are interaction effects that are going on. We found another SNP that was close to significant, and it's near a gene that's involved in brain development and vaccine response. Now, others working with other populations have found genes that increase fertility early in life while increasing risk of cancer late in life, the way EOMIS did in our study. One of them is P53. P53 is a gene where variation is very often involved in cancer risk. The variants that increase cancer risk increase reproductive performance early in life. The early onset breast cancer gene, brick a has the same seems to have the same characteristics. That's actually extremely interesting. It means that some of the burden of degenerative disease that we are now experiencing worldwide was put in place before the demographic transition by the evolution of life histories. These genes both had advantages at that time, and the costs were not paid because people didn't die of cancer then. They died before they would get cancer, of infectious disease or childbirth or violence or other things. So we will return and to this issue and discuss this in greater detail after we discuss the evolution of aging. Okay, so there are genetic trade-offs as one definition of 
this relationship. What about physiology? Well, hormones mediate these trade-offs as well. And there's a very interesting situation in males. Testosterone and other androgens are, change the allocation between investment in bone and muscle and investment in reproduction and immunity. During an infection, energy is switched from maintaining muscle and blood cells and bone to increasing the immune response, and that is a stronger response in males than in females. In an uninfected male, the normal maintenance of secondary sexual characters by androgens diverts energy away from immune function and increases susceptibility to disease. So in one study, men who received a flu vaccination experienced the drop in testosterone for two weeks. So in short, macho can make you sick, or it can at least make you susceptible. In women, the major mediator here of life history trade-offs is, is a protein hormone called leptin. Leptin is regulating energy intake and expenditure, and it does so by, by affecting appetite and metabolism. It's basically a signal of how much fat there is in the body. It is secreted by fat cells. And it's in the blood, and any other organ in the body can monitor it and can therefore have a measure of just how fat a body am I in, and therefore what should I do about it. It binds to a part of the hypothalamus, which is called the satiety center. It signals the brain that the body has eaten enough. It inhibits neurons, neurons that stimulate eating. It stimulates neurons that inhibit eating. When women come under nutritional stress, some reproductive traits respond and some don't. And that's interesting because that how, shows how the body prioritizes these traits. Things that are sensitive are ovarian function, duration of gestation, and final birth weight. But the rate at which energy is supplied to the embryo is not very sensitive to leptin levels. Pregnant and nursing mothers are strongly stressed by poor nutrition, and that causes early births of underweight infants. It increases interbirth intervals. However, milk production is relatively insensitive. So if the baby makes it through, the mother will probably continue to produce adequate milk even if she is starting to starve. So those are some ways of looking at trade-offs. Do they evolve more slowly than other traits? Well, Sometimes they evolve nearly as fast. There's an important trade-off in bacteria, which basically is the trade-off between antibiotic resistance and the ability to compete with other bacteria. It costs something to produce the molecules that resist antibiotics. And in the absence of the antibiotic, a bacterium that doesn't uh, resist actually is competitively superior. So what happens if bacteria are continually exposed to antibiotics. Well, as soon as genes no longer have a fitness cost, in the absence, when they become neutral, they'll persist a very long time, and such genes become neutral because of compensatory evolution. So the resistance is costing something. Evolution adjusts that cost to reduce it. As soon as it's been reduced enough, resistance becomes neutral, and then it's very hard to get rid of. That is rapid evolution of a trade-off, in this case, just six months. So evolution acts to reduce costs, and it can do so rapidly. To summarize on trade-offs, they're everywhere. They're the default condition. If someone claims that a trade-off doesn't exist, then really, at this point in our understanding of the field, the burden of proof is on them, because our default assumption is everything's involved in a trade-off. For traits in a patient that are involved in trade-offs, a change that improves one could worsen another. For example, negative side effects of drugs, a trade-off between testosterone and disease resistance, uh, and probably most importantly, the trade-off between reproduction and survival. That is the centerpiece of the evolution of aging.